Hey, uh, I just first want to say thank you to Pastor Lee and Jane. Uh, just a little bit about me. Jen, my wife and I, Jennifer, helped plant this Radiant Church with Pastor Lee and Jane. We served here 17 years ago. And for the first 17 years until we planted a church in Jackson, Michigan, Radiant Church there. And I love Pastor Lee's heart, and I want to honor, just honor him. Just starting out, isn't this been an amazing conference? It's, I say this every year, but like this has been the best one. But every year it's just like, it's getting better, it's getting better. So uh, can we just pray for a minute? And uh, Father, Lord, just thank you for this opportunity. So really to talk about Jesus' heart for freedom and uh, Lord, I pray that something is deposited in our, in our hearts that aches for what heaven is aching for. Lord, uh, I pray, Lord, that there's something contagious. Freedom is contagious. And I pray, Father, that we catch a piece of that, Lord, and take it to our churches, our friends, our family, Lord. And I welcome you in this place and pray for your presence and your Holy Spirit to just speak, Lord. It's going to be 30,000 foot view, but I believe you're going to inspire things as we talk, that you're going to put dreams and hearts as we process through this over this next hour. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm reminded that Isaiah said, uh, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. And Father, there, there are many in our church that are weir- worn out. Uh, they're heavy laden. They have the, they're, they're carrying burdens. And it takes men and women of God who will get a word from you. The sovereign Lord gives us a well-instructed tongue that just sustains them. And Father, so I pray that uh, even though we're talking about a few concepts, that you would take these concepts and birth it into life-giving things in our ministries, in our marriages, in our churches, Father, that uh, would sustain the weary around us so that they don't live that way, so that they live free. So Holy Spirit, come, speak, and minister through these few minutes that we have together uh, in, in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, when I got the email, uh, Pastor Lee had asked me, hey, want you to teach on freedom. Uh, this has just been a passion for me over the last 10 years. I'll share just a quick a quick story of how I discovered another level of freedom because, you know, there's levels of it. It's not just, you know, we get saved, we said a prayer, now we're going to heaven, and that's awesome. But God just keeps peeling layers over our lives, and we get more free and more free. Or we can just get stuck and stay stuck because there's levels. There, there's actually levels of freedom. So uh, I, when I was on staff here in 2009, um, church was growing. Everything was well. My marriage was healthy. My family was healthy. Finance, everything in life was healthy, but I was struggling, and I didn't know why. Like, if you looked externally, it was like, like living the dream. I thought, Jen and I thought we'd always be here in Kalamazoo forever. And I started, I was, I was not sleeping. Little decisions were getting hard for me to make. So I was the worship pastor here. And uh, some of my assistant would say, hey, what key do you want to do this song? And you want an A or B? And that one, de- that's an easy decision, by the way. And I'm just, like, collapsing over it. Like, oh, my gosh, can you just pick the key? Like, and I was so crushed. Well, one day I walk in Pastor Lee's office, and um, I had just told my wife, I, I, I had a, some meltdown here, and I, and I left. And I said, I don't know what's going on. I think I'm depressed. And so I d- did like an online, you know, never do those online tests, but I did one. And like, you're certainly depressed. Go see a doctor. And uh, so, you know, and I'm trying to hide this. The only person that knows is my wife. So, you know, here at church, I'm putting on the mask. You get this. And anyone in ministry feels this pressure, especially in, uh, you know, in charismatic circles, life-giving churches. You don't ever want to appear that you ain't fully healed. And so that mask, you know, I put that mask on. I was in a room full of, my intention was that I would uh, portray like this really free person that I wasn't. So I go to Pastor Lee, we're talking, I walk in his office and um and I'm telling him about, uh, we're talking about Sunday coming up, I think. And he just said, in his most sincere eyes, but it's one of those things where he says, hey, how are you? 
And, you know, in the moment, my brain is saying, do not tell him. <laughs> but the question just felt like such an invitation, and it, like, gushed out of me. And I'm like, I'm smiling, like, not good. And I just start crying. And, and he's, like, looking at, like, what's going on with Mike? And he, but I'll never forget this. He said, hey, he was really generous to my heart. He said, listen, I want you to know, because I told him, like, I'm not doing good. Like, I'm depressed. My doctor diagnosed me. He's put me on medication. I'm trying to hide it. I'm sorry I'm hiding. He's like, oh, no. And he was very gracious. He said, you, there's no pressure from me for you to heal quickly through this. And then he said, hey, I want you to, uh, I, I want you to go on this event. Uh, and he sends me on this event down in Texas. It was a week-long event. And I didn't know what I was walking into. But I hadn't told anybody, but I secretly had made a decision. If, if I don't get some freedom, and I don't know if I was using that word yet, but if I don't get some level of freedom, uh, I think I'm probably done with ministry. Ministry wasn't the problem, but it was a lot of pressure. And, and we're a growing church, and we were doing Saturday nights. I was the only worship leader, and there were other departments I was overseeing. So it was just like a lot. You know, we didn't have the staff back then that, we, that they have now. So, uh, but I made that decision. If, you know, if there isn't some radical change happening, I'm going to probably resign. Go be a truck driver, I, I was thinking. And uh, so I go on this event, and it's a men's event, and they don't really tell you what you're walking into, which now I see as really wisdom. And uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> I, uh, I go on this event, day one, nothing, day two, nothing, day three, and I'm just like, and everyone else is getting some, some kind of freedom, and I'm just like, what am I doing here? And then day three it was a fast day. And they kind of send you out in the wilderness and, uh, or, out, you know, outside. You go outside, and it's like a 500-acre ranch. And so I go outside on this ranch, and I'm on my fast day, and I'm starting just to unpack some things in my soul. They gave us a process for it. And uh, about middle of the day, while I'm writing a letter, just writing a letter to God in my, on my fast day journal, and uh, the, Lord, the Lord started speaking to me as I was writing. And he said, Mike, you never, you never let me love you. And I said, oh, I know you love me. And, uh, and, like, and I'm mad that the Lord is saying this, too. Like, there's, like, a little bit of resentment. Like, I know you love me. And he says, yeah, you know I love you, but you don't let me love you. And there is a difference. And, and when he said that, it, like, cracked my heart wide open. He gave me, like, this vision. And, and so I'm sort of weeping, and I'm just absorbing this love that I've never felt before. And I'm 35 years old. This was, you know, 12 years ago. I'm 35 years old, and, uh, and I've never felt, and I had been in ministry here full time. I think it, by that time, uh, I don't know, a long time, not quite 10 years, but in full time ministry, saved at 10 years old, rad, got filled with the Holy Spirit at 19 or 20 years old. So I've had encounters with God, and I knew he loved me, but I didn't let him love me. There was a difference. And when that switch happened in my heart, everything, even like the ministry here, it all, all of a sudden felt like an invitation. Like, oh, I, I don't have to do this. Like, this is just an invitation from the Lord. So I came off that event. I came back. I didn't quit. Stayed. <laughs> and, um, and two years later, the, the, the Lord would call me to plant uh, our, our Radiant Church in Jackson, Michigan. I tell you that story because um, that was the turning point. And I knew leaving that ranch in Texas, I'm going to get as many men set free. Because I think most men, and especially people in ministry, we have to have this front of perfection. Or we got it all together. Or we got all the answers. And there's a lot of anxiety. If you have to have solutions for everybody. If you have to always have the answers. If you always if it always have to... If it, Always has to be perfect. This is a lot of pressure. So that moment just flipped my heart. And I, and I didn't know pastoring. I didn't know I was going to be a pastor. I thought I would be here. I thought it would be some, something that would branch out a radiant church here in Kalamazoo. But the Lord told me plant a church. So we planted a church. I think the first year and a half, um, we planted the church and got it moving. And I knew, like, I'm going to get men set free. If I get men set free, I'll start healing families in the church. And then, then we'll, we'll branch off and do a women's one. And that's what we did. So... My passion for freedom happened on that ranch in 2000, April of 2010. So I just want to, uh, first verse here, and it, that was introduction, which wasn't part of my notes. So, um, but I just want you to know why I'm passionate about what I'm going to say. Uh, Paul says this in Galatians 5.1, it, it is for freedom Christ has set us free. 
You know, it's, we don't just say a prayer so that one day we go to heaven. On this side of eternity, there's, there's freedom for us. Um, and then he says this, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. He's saying this to Christians. It's possible to be a Christian and not be free. But Jesus said, I think it's John 10, 10, I have come to give life and life more abundantly. And you know, if you look that up in the Greek, it's really saying this. I've come to give you life, and then when you get that life, I'm going to give you more. And then when you get to that level, I'm going to give you more life, and then more life. And then this is the freedom, this peace, this life is joy. So freedom from what? Because we get saved, we still have all the events of our past. There are lies that we, we may be believing uh, there may be sin in our life. There may be inner vows we made, heart ties, demonic oppression, things like this, that God has to work out of our hearts. So I want to give you three definitions of freedom. If I have enough time, I want to give you one tool that we use in, for personal ministry. If I don't have enough time, I'll shoot a video and we'll email it to you guys. So, Because uh, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to sh kind of share everything I brought today. So three definitions of freedom. Number one, freedom, the Bible describes freedom as this, the presence of someone, not the absence of a problem. Now where the Lord is, where, where the, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It's not the absence of your problem. And this is what we do as Christians. We say, well, what's the solution? And which we seek solutions. And when we start seeking solutions, that's, that's becoming the priority of our life. And then it starts to dominate our mind. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all of these other things will get added to you. So what he's saying, when we seek first the kingdom of God, it starts reprioritizing our life. And it's not about the solution. It just starts working itself out. Freedom is the presence of Christ. We often have the wrong definition of freedom. If Change my environment, I'll be free. If I got a better job, if my boss didn't put these stipulations on me, we, we may define freedom as the absence of some behavior. If I could quit cussing or if I stopped being angry, if I could get rid of this pride. And what we're doing is we're seeking, we're seeking a, the wrong definition because that is not freedom. You need Jesus. You need an encounter with the Lord in his presence to permeate your heart that starts unlocking you. Number two, it says the truth that we know. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So two biblical definitions. Number one, it's the presence of Christ. It's not the, not the absence of a problem. It's the presence of Christ. Number two, it's the truth we know. So when I was on this, let me say it differently. It's the truth that we actually get. You get it. I knew Jesus loved me, but I didn't get it until I was 35 years old. Like, wait a minute, I'm more deeply loved that's a truth I knew, and it set me free. And I gained a level of freedom that just started unlocking my heart. Uh, so it all boils down to identity, and this is the third one. Freedom is the ability, because once you encounter the presence of Christ and he starts revealing truth to you, you're going to gain some identity, and you're going to be able to respond more appropriately to difficult things. Because if there is a truth that can set us free, then there is a lie that can keep us locked up. And then once we start getting that truth that sets us free, and we start encountering the presence of Christ, now we're, we're and out of that, you're going to discover identity, who you are in the Lord, as he unlocks your heart and reveals these lies to you, starts speaking truth, so you get set free. And now when you have the problem, or you have the environment that's difficult, you can start responding out of that identity. And it's a different way. Instead of seeking the solution. All right, is this making sense? All right. So I just want to give you, that's our definition. If you say, hey, what do you mean by freedom? We're going to tell you, well, it's knowing who you are as Jesus starts unpacking these struggles in your life or the lies you believe and the events. All the events are real. Like all the, the past and the trauma, it's real. But what you believe in about it probably isn't. So let him speak to that and give you some truth and it'll unlock your heart. So that's our definition of freedom. We'll, we'll always say those three things. Presence of Christ, not the absence of your problems. Because you're always going to have problems. There's always going to be conflict. There's always going to be financial struggles. There's always going to be breakdowns 
you know, we're going to always have to process through all that. So we're not going to be absent of problems ever on this side of eternity. So what we need is the presence of Christ within those problems so that we can respond out of that identity and freedom. All right. So there we have kind of four avenues that we help people in freedom in our church. I think all four are going to come up and I'm going to unpack just a little bit of, of each one is the number one as a lead pastor, we or as a leader or a ministry in your church, you have to practice and model freedom to your church and your team as leaders. That's the you have to be set free. Now, Jesus said, "Freely you've received, freely what?" And you can't give that unless you have it. So that's the first step: is you yourself as leaders get free. Uh, and you're saying, well, how do we do that? Well, I, well, I'm working my way there. So, but once you get that level, the first step is you get set free so you can start giving that to people in your church. Like, and just ask the Lord, am I free? Is, you know, Paul says it to the Galatians. Hey, what, what, he tells them, what made you get, yo, what made you put, what put you back in slavery? He's asking them. So it's possible to be Christian and get locked up again. So ask the Lord, am I locked up? Is there something, do I wear a mask that I need to take off? Do I have vulnerability? Do I have the freedom? Do I have the authenticity that Jesus really wants me to walk in? You get set free too. Number two, we offer uh, a class um, two or three times a year. We're kind of tweaking it right now, but we have offered a class two or three times a year on freedom. And what we do over three or four weeks, they'll come like, you know, middle, midweek. We'll do, we teach them how to hear God. We teach them levels of freedom. This is the, the, the kind of core concepts. The anatomy of a stronghold, which I hope I can give you today. That's the, I want to give you that one because um, I think that's one thing that everyone in the room could use right away is the anatomy of a stronghold. Here's how strongholds get formed in people's lives, and here's how you get them out of it. Um, and then understanding kingdom thinking. like That's the pathway to stay free and to keep living this way. So one, we, we practice it ourselves and we model it to other people. We teach it uh, throughout the year. Sometimes it's a message series, but mostly it's a, within the rhythm, rhythm of our um, community group semesters. We'll pop this in there. It's called, our class is called Living Free. We hear God, levels of freedom, anatomy of a stronghold, and understanding some kingdom thinking. When I'm talking about levels of freedom. It's uh, there are levels of freedom. One is, you know, change environment is a level. If I can change my environment, I will, I will be free. And again, we call that the wrong definition, but it's true. If you can, how many of you have ever been on a road and you felt you got to get somewhere, you're in a hurry, and you just felt like if everybody else was off the road, I would be better off. All right, that's environment. The next level would be behavior. Like, if I could just change my behavior. So what if you said, well, what if we adjusted your attitude? And it's not about all the other cars. And it's just about adjusting the behavior. So now I'm going to respond differently to all that behavior. That right there is another level and has power over environment. So now I don't have to worry about the cars getting away because this, I've, I've kind of stepped up to another level of freedom. And then the next level is capabilities. The next one's beliefs. The, the fourth level is like beliefs. Like, what do you believe about God and what do you believe about you? And because what you believe about God and what you believe about you will have power over all those others. And the fifth one is identity, which only God can give you. Every one of you have been wired by God. There's a blueprint, a DNA. On it. He's uniquely made you. And when you discover that identity, that starts impacting the beliefs about you, the beliefs about God. And then you're kind of getting set free from all those other levels. All right. So number three is we provide personal ministry that leads people out of strongholds. So um, sometimes we'll do the living free class and it's like people start having aha moments and they can't really unpack that in the room. Uh, so we'll set up personal ministries and we walk them through a, a stronghold of, of anatomy. If I have time, I'm going to teach you that. But I'm taking too much time. Um, and then number four, well, let me just pause for a minute. Uh, I'll come back to number four. I want to talk about this personal ministry. So I had a gentleman, this is when I was here. I've been practicing this ministry of strongholds, of working people out of the anatomy of a stronghold many years now. But as just about my last year here, I had someone come in for personal ministry. He had just found out his wife was having an affair, and they were going to move and uh, move to another city. And he's like, I don't know what to do. He's, 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 I need a solution. So he's coming to my office. I need a solution. 
Uh, I'm finding this out about my marriage, and we're getting ready to move to a whole other city, and I don't know what to do. And I said, well, I think the Holy Spirit has something he wants to say to you. So, because I didn't know what to tell him. So I, I just said to him, hey, would you ask the Lord if there's any lie you're believing right now? So he, he goes into prayer with me, and he's, he sees a lie. And he's kind of surprised by it. And I'm writing it down. Because I'm not surprised by it. Because once you do this like 100 times, you start figuring out the devil's schemes. There's nothing. <laughs> he's got nothing new. And so once you figure out, oh, here's his scheme. So he, he, un, he shares it with me. And then I said, hey, ask the Lord where it came from. So I'm, dry, I'm drilling it down for him. And he says, he has like, oh, my gosh. This, is, he said, this all, almost always happens. That don't make sense. I said, no, that's the Lord. It does make sense. Say, tell me what you're hearing. And so he has this childhood event. The event's real, you know, traumatic. But what he believed about it wasn't. So he's living his entire adult life out of this lie that this event has caused. And say, well, let's renounce the lie. And what is the truth? And he gets this truth. And he's, he's weeping. It is, this whole thing takes me about 40-some minutes. We get all done. I said, we, we never talk about what to do with the marriage. We never talk about moving to another city. Nothing. I said, but this is how God always works. He kind of like unlocks your heart, and then you just know what to do. Because you seek first the kingdom of God, and then all the other things get added to you. So we sought the kingdom first. What's God want to say about this? And I said, hey, do you know what to do about your marriage? And um, where you, if you're gonna, supposed to move or not? He said, yes, I know what to do. I'm going to move. He said, I don't know how I know that. Well, you sought the kingdom, and now you just know. Intuitively, he knew what to do. And we didn't even seek the solution because he got free. So the other thing we do is we create, and this is, this is really what I want to share with you because it's been the most powerful piece in our church. We have a three, you, you can create, and I'm going to give you big pieces of this in a minute, overview of this. But we create a three to four day event, a freedom event that does deep soul care. And, um, and this is what I experienced in Texas. My event was a week. It was just, that's way too much soul digging for me. So uh, I, I trimmed it down to like a four-day thing, and I don't have time to share all the process of that, but that we, got, we feel like we're finding a sweet spot for this. And for us, it's been a three- or four-year journey, and we've, we, we have an event for men we call Awaken, an event for women called Bloom, and it is just unlocking hearts in our church. And I want to just share like some of the things we're seeing as a result of this three-day event, like men who never lift their hands in worship start lifting their hands. People who, we, we have one guy, he, they never tithe. Always, there's always a reason. He, he goes on this event, he just comes back, starts tithing. We, we, we have um, people who didn't trust leadership come and get some deep soul care and all of a sudden are serving the church passionately and like God has healed that wound. I, I mean, it's just incredible. The, the, the men or women, whatever event, they'll come back from the church, and it always elevates the worship for that service because they always return on a Sunday. And when they get back, the level of freedom that these people have gained, I mean, it's just rocking their world. and It elevates what's happening in the room because of the freedom, and it's contagious. So once these guys get set free, and we've probably had 100 men over the last four years um, go through these because we only do three a year it's not a lot of people it's like 12 to 16 guys 12 to 14 women that we go through these events um and there, you might say well why is that because listen sunday's a, a high invitation low impact low invitation always has high impact and that's what we're learning about this we, we can't do this for the masses because there's like some deep soul stuff happening so the results are like life changes and marriages, marriages being renewed, people start serving. Um, we've had people get prayer languages. Uh, I'm just thinking of a couple. I mean, it's just amazing the freedom, and it sticks. And then once they get set free, now we have men's groups. You know, it was hard to launch a men's group before we started doing this. And then once we start getting men set free, they're like, I got to get other guys set free. And same for the women. Now, the men's events, it always takes us a while to get those full. But by the time we get to the event, it's full. Um, but for women, this was our second year doing it. The moment we open the event, it fills. And I'm not, that's not like a joke. It's like for real. I, I think we filled it in 
Pastor Jeff, how long? I'm, less than 24 hours, three events filled for the whole year. Um, this, this event, so these men, you, we got to push men to it. So we'll like pray, like, Lord, who's the men in our church we want to invite to this? It's always resistance because guys, you know, they know there's something deep that's going to happen. <laughs> because the other guys, like, people will come back. Wives will say, what would you do to my husband? When I came back from my wife, she touched my face like, you're like a different man. Well, I just, my, God unlocked my heart. And so, but once we, once we do that, now we got guys that want to serve. This. So think about this. Women usually serve events. Like, they're just like, that's what um, Corey talked about in the last service. Like, women just, just will go there, will serve men. It's like, you know, I'm busy. No, you're not. But once we do these events, we, we have to, we, we tell men they can't serve. When we opened up the event for those who wanted to serve, we filled it in 30 seconds. Literally. We, we said, we put the website, hey, if you want to serve the event, here's how you do it. Boom. And our admin was like, I was watching my phone. Was, because they keep, they'll keep going back and serving other men. So we're really seeing this like unlocking hearts and it's sticking, it's working, it's infiltrating our, our church. And it's one of the ways that we're making disciples because if you look at ancient times, you spent a lot of time together. You were at, I mean, Jesus spent three years with these guys walking. We don't have that in our culture anymore. So it seems radical to, to spend like four days with just a few men and, and unlock their hearts or, or, or women and unlock their hearts, but it's what we need. It's not a fix-all, but is a great reorientation, a great reset, and the freedom they get, they start craving it. And then, and then we walked it out with them, as, as they say. And I think it's one of the main reasons why we're going to our church. People come in. Visitors come in. They, they sense the presence of God. They see the freedom on people's life because uh, you, you can't hide it. So um, I've asked. This is one of our associate pastors. Um, this is Pastor Jeff Allen. You can come on up, Jeff. Give him a hand because he's, he's him. Yeah, you can grab that mic. So Pastor Jeff attended one of our first events. I think it was 2016. Yep. 2016. Share with them your story because I think if you share your story, it would maybe help some, some in the room. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Yeah, um, so back in 2016, I think you could say if there's anybody that didn't need to go on this event, it was me uh, because I was a fully supported missionary serving full time looking to go overseas to plant a church. Uh, my wife and I uh, kind of got connected with Pastor Mike. They're supporting us. We were going to go to Indonesia. And uh, I was working at a Bible college teaching students to read and understand the Word of God and to become missionaries themselves. So it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't need that. Um, <laughs> but if there was anybody who needed it, it was me. Because I knew how God viewed me, but I didn't know how God viewed me. And uh, I, I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody of what your identity is in Scripture, and we, can, we could talk circles about that. But um, what I realized later was I was so functional in my brokenness that I didn't even know I needed healing. Mm. And I came away, on, I went on this event and, uh, you know, viewed God like, I know you love me, but do you really like me? That was kind of how... <laughs> How I, how I acted toward him, like like we do at fi with family, like uh, I'll cry at your funeral, but I don't want to go on vacation with you type thing. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> just being real, I, I'm free, so I can just tell you about it. <laughs> uh, so um, that's great. I went there viewing God as a taskmaster to be pleased. And I came home with a loving father to be trusted. And uh, we have a process where we help pull people through that, and uh, it just changed my life in, in a totally different way, and um, it shifted the way I view God and the way God, the way I understood God views me. And we have a saying where no hearts fully healed yep. and no hearts too far gone, yes. but every heart is ready for an encounter with the Lord. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. I'll, I'll say some I want them to know 
your yeah. sensations background. Oh, okay. Because okay. yeah. this unlocked you from all that. Just so, real quick. Yeah. Uh, the organization I was with, they'd call themselves non-denominational, but honestly, if you go to homeschooling drives and Baptist churches to get your student population, you're pretty much a Baptist place. So... Um, <clears throat> They were cessationist background. In fact, in order to serve with this mission organization, I had to sign a letter saying I, I believe all the gifts of the through this or all the gifts of the spirit ceased. Um, I never bought into that, but I just thought, well, okay, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, and yeah, this event just totally reoriented the way I looked at God, and I quit. There came a moment probably right after I got home or, or at some point in the weekend where I just decided I'm going to quit telling you, God, how you love me and just ask you to show me how you love me. Yeah. Oh. And it shifted everything. Yeah. Um, wow. yeah, That's that? great. Okay. Thank you, Pastor oh. Jeff. Thank you. Can we thank him? <laughs> so I'll share the rest of the story. I want to give you the colorful version. Okay. Jeff was moving to Indonesia, him and his wife, and we we're going to send them off from our church. And the Lord said, hey, I want you to hire Jeff to be to be an associate pastor at your church. I got plans for him. I, this is a true story. I think it was November 2017. I can't remember. It was a while ago. And I said, Lord, he's Baptist. <laughs> like, we're a spirit-filled church. Like, I'm not going to hire a Baptist guy. And he's like, no, you, you hire him because I got plans for him. Just trust me. So I said, I'll do it, but you got to tell him not to go to Indonesia. So it was our 21 days of prayer and fasting that, that next January. And he says, I, I, uh, Crystal and I, we've been fasting, and we feel like the Lord's telling us to stay. And I'm like, oh, the Lord's doing it. <laughs> and uh, so I sit him down, and Pastor Jeff, he, he gets on staff. And I remember a month before I'm ordaining him, he said, hey, you know I take issues with, like, laying hands on people for, you know, all that baptism stuff you believe. And I said, yeah, I know that. And so we talked to you, like, what that looked like. <laughs> I'm just trusting God. I'm like, oh, God, please, I got to know that I really heard you. <laughs> and I can't, we don't have time to share how he gets there. But, I mean, God used this event, unlocks his heart. The event is the reason why he stayed. It was part of it because he's like, he's, what he told me, you didn't share this part, and I think I have permission. You can correct me later. That's good. <laughs> um, he, uh, he said, I've never seen an environment where, you know, I could like, share the, what's going on in my life and still be loved in, in the telling of it. And the two environments, that, the environment he was working in at, at the school and the environment he's seen at church is like, that's what I want. It's like, so he, he, he said, I, I want to help what God's doing here. And now he facilitates all our men's events and uh, and uh, walks alongside, alongside of um, my wife, who uh, facilitates the, the Bloom events. I want to give you an overview of these events. And obviously, these are four-day events. So these are big, big, big 30,000-foot view. And there's a lot of details in this. And our heart is, we're seeing so much freedom. We're like, let's give this away to everybody we can. It's not a quick process. This takes a lot of time. But our heart is like, let's get this in every life-giving church because we need people set free. You know, when I'm hearing last night um, John Tyson say, we need deep repentance. Like these events, we give that opportunity. That you don't get on a Sunday morning. Where it's Sunday, we can't do what happened here this morning and last night on a Sunday morning, right? Like, but we do need a space. And we do need a, a, a safe place where we can have this deep repentance or this deep soul care where people really get set free so here is a quick um process nope oh did i not give you the overview okay i'm just gonna tell you this all right it's not in the notes so day one so it's a four-day event i'm just gonna tell you day one's a story day so this is this is what we this is how we do our events big thirty thousand foot view people come in they share their story we're asking for hey are you married so we give them 10 minutes they share their story day one, um, and we do a salvation check somewhere. In the, they, they show up like at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and it takes the whole afternoon for every person to kind of tell their story. And at the end of the night, we're asking for a salvation check. Do you know the Lord? We do have people get saved at these events who, who didn't know the Lord or they didn't know when they got saved. Um, and while they're telling their story, we're looking for wounds. We're looking for life events, things like that. 
It's very interesting. Wounds come out very quickly. We have people that just say, I wasn't going to say any of that. Well, we prayed and we knew that they would. Listen, the reason why we tell, to ask people to tell their stories is because, listen, your story is sacred because we've encountered God. And I, we want to honor your story. We want to honor people's pain. And because if God will do it for them, he'll do it for others. That means our stories are prophetic. So we have them start out telling stories, you know, as just a, a way to get in. And the staff is taking notes. Day two is a fast day. So um, we give a participant's guide. And on fast day, they're working through uh, the process to hear God. Also on fast day, we ask them not to talk. It's a covenant of silence. And we send them out into the woods, and, uh, and we walk them through a six- or seven-hour day of fasting with the Lord. Um, and the Holy Spirit walks them through certain pieces. Um, what's happening on fast day, and God miraculously does this. We, we give a system to it, but the Holy Spirit breathes light. We give a skeleton. God puts flesh on it. And uh, so they, they're learning about inner vows, on fast day, they're learning about strongholds. They're learning about soul ties. Uh, they're learning about lies they believe. They're, they're learning about deep-seated fears. This is all in the, the content we're giving them. Now, what's amazing is people will come on this event, and you know, it's like Pastor Jeff, how would you say it? I was so, so functional in my brokenness. And they'll come back on fast day and say, I didn't even know I had this. Uh, I'm thinking of the event in... Um, October, we had two men in their 70s. Uh, and I, uh, I had one man who, who was kind of like untrusting of the leadership in our church. He's in his late 60s. And he said, um, you know, I thought I worked through a lot of stuff. He said, it wasn't until now that I really got set free. We had one man, 65 years old, just share with our church on this Sunday. I, didn't, I, I learned how loved I am. So, I mean, it's just amazing. Well, God's... They're like, they think, I thought I worked through all that. Okay, day three. And this is kind of like, this is the piece we really don't talk about publicly because if people knew it was coming, they wouldn't go. <laughs> um, so what we tell, you know, Jesus said this. This is true. He said to his disciples, I got more to tell you. It's more than you can bear. So we don't want to unpack everything in a public setting like this because they're like, no, I ain't going to do that. Because we know it's more than they can bear until they're in the moment. And the Holy Spirit's like unlocking hearts, and they're getting freedom. They're figuring out, oh, I'm in a safe place. And so day three, um, we go into a deep soul care as the Holy Spirit leads them. So we don't push anybody. We don't pull anybody. Sometimes it doesn't happen for some because they won't go there. They won't trust the process. I would say 99% of the time people do. Um, but sometimes, you know, they weren't ready. They went because they thought it was going to be a fun retreat. And they're like, whoa, this got deep real quick. So day three is a soul care day. We process with the participants as the Holy Spirit leads them. It's most, this is the most powerful day for men and women in our events because they work through traumas. They work through lies. They work through fear. They work through unforgiveness. Identity starts forming at their heart in this point. This is kind of the big piece. So day one is story, day two is fast, day three is deep soul care. This is a deliverance day. And we've seen everything on this from uh, minor sins to demonic manifestations, and we set people free. So you've got to have the right leaders, you know, who understand their authority in Christ and, and walk in that. But we, we, we walk, the churches that we've trained with walk alongside of us, and we're doing the same with anybody. We're just walk through and help them do this. And day four is a, an affirming and celebration day. So story day, fast day, soul care day, and an affirmation day. We end, this is on Saturday. The weekend ends with significant reaffirming freedom and identity things throughout that whole day. Um, there are some teaching components sprinkled through all four days. Um, but that, that's just the... Just one piece of it. One thing we do uh, that's very significant, and it really just affirms, because last day is an affirming day, the facilitators of the events, we, we pray over every person by number, not by name. We don't know who we're praying for. 
And for about two weeks before the event starts, we're asking for prophetic words, pictures, images, things we can say to that person that just affirms him. We don't ask who it is. We don't, get, we don't do by name. We just do by numbers. So if it's 16 people, for two weeks we're praying for these 16 people. We end the event affirming them. They, they did some deep soul care. We end the event giving every person a prophetic word. They draw that number that night. And, uh, and it's amazing how people say dead on. Those words were dead on. Well, that's because we serve a God who does speak. And what happened to you on fast day and now on day four, we are affirming that uh, and giving more affirmation to the day come like, I heard God. I heard God. So this is our, that's kind of the biggest piece of freedom in our church mixed with all the other the, the other things. So if this is something you think you might want to do, you know, it, it's a process to get started, but we'll walk with any church that wants to do this. Because we just, I just beg you if you're a pastor, if you are a leader in this church, there are men who don't know how locked up they are. There are Christians in our church who are like the Galatians, yoked again with slavery, don't even know it. Functional in their pain. And we don't have anything in our society anymore that really knits men's heart together. War does because we stick them together in a troop and they battle and their hearts get knit together. Well, this is a spiritual battle and the same, we're seeing the same thing happen. Do something for your men and then it, it will, as soon as wives, this was happening for us. This, we, we, we did this for two or three years before we ever launched a women's one. And so we, and women were getting frustrated. We want something like that. I know, but it's too important just to shoot from the hip. So we had to, you know, we, we just launched ours last year. Um, and if you, so if you want some information about that, here's a, here's not my email, but Pastor Jeff <laughs> would love to answer any questions. J. Allen at Radiant JXN. I almost gave him your cell number, but I didn't think you'd like that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, delete it. Uh, our process, just to tell you, if you want to do and you would attend an event, we would give you some facilitating training pieces on levels of freedom, stronghold, deliverance, hearing God. We give, that we want is foundational for everyone who leads these events. And then uh, we would have a facilitator in admin training day, and then we have you shadow an event with us with key, your key leaders participating. And then we train with your event, and we, we stand alongside of you, and hopefully by event three or four. So we're, you know, it's a year of processing together, and we hold, we hold people's hands. Um, we've released one church in it. Um, we're to, we just had two churches attend our last one last week, or the week before last. I can't even remember. Last week. Last week. And um, so it's just amazing. And then we release them to do their own. Now, I want to, I got 12 minutes left, so I could ask, answer questions, or I could give you the anatomy of a stronghold. Anatomy of a stronghold, okay. All right, so there's no notes for this, because we're going to, the, the network said they would just email them to everybody, because I was going to give these out, um, but they didn't know how many were going to be in this. So I want, this is, a, this is a, a thing we use for personal ministry. This is one of the things we use at the event. So I talked about inner vows. I talked about, you know, there's, we walk you through soul ties, lies, wounds, trauma. Um, but the anatomy of a stronghold, I want to talk to you about this. Um, because this is something we use in personal ministry, and it's probably the key thing we use. Now, don't, you, don't approach this as a formula. We, we approach it as a skeleton, and God kind of branches off where he wants to go. But I'm going to give you the skeleton. So 2 Corinthians talks about a stronghold, right? For though, for though we walk, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, I can't believe I'm going to do this in like 10 minutes. Though we walk in the, in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not, are, are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive and obey it to Christ. Of course, we all know this. So um, 
This is, this is what the Bible tells us what a stronghold is. It's arguments, thoughts that are not aligned with God, um, lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God, thoughts that are disobedient to Christ, which is fear, lust, anger, shame, wrong patterns of thoughts. Now, that's what, a, that's what we just read in, in Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. If you like drill down into the Greek, you, you, the, all these things start coming up. What Ephesians 4 says, do not give the devil a foothold. He's talking to Christians. Christians can give devil the place in their life. It's, it's the word uh, topos, literally, li- means literally ground. Um, these lofty opinions that are against the knowledge of God, these are the lies that we are believing. This is wrong theology or wrong interpretations of trauma or events in our life. So if, if you could picture like a baseball diamond, home plate, first base, second base, third base, negative events. This is, I'm gonna teach, this is the anatomy of a stronghold. how a stronghold gets formed in our life. Negative events happen. A lot of times when we walk people through this, they almost always, 80% of the time, will go to a childhood wound. So negative events are hurts, traumas, um, wounds that are off, maybe wounds even repeated throughout life. It, it could even be like the absence of a parent. So it's not like something wounding you, but the non-presence is the wound. Um, it's what you, do, you experienced or did not. This can be generational inheritance, like uh, genetic, spiritual, family, culture, the way you grew up. So we link struggles to events, but the enemy tells us what the event means. So I went, my wife and I got in our early 20s, I've been married um, not, almost 30 years. Um, my wife and I in our early 20s went, almost went, we did go bankrupt. We, we had a lot of debt. So the bankruptcy was real. We're, we're attending here at Radiant Church. This was back in 2000, so 22 years ago. We're attending here at the church. Pastor Lee knew he's walking us through that. I remember at, at the attorney's office, like, weeping because I said, God, I'm a tither. You know, I'm like, I'm mad at God. I, you know, I'm telling him all this stuff. And, um, and the Holy Spirit quickly, you know, addressed it. Like, you're, you're not going bankruptcy because you're tithing. You're going bankruptcy because you've been stupid with your finances and you thought tithing was a miracle was going to get you out of it. <laughs> and it wasn't. But the lie, I, the bankruptcy was real, but the lie I believed is that credit score determined my identity. And so for years, like seven years, maybe even longer after that bankruptcy, I felt like a failure. And I'd look at my credit score and I'd be in this you know, five or six hundreds and I would be like, oh, that's what the enemy does. The event's real, but what I believed was that number meant something to my life. All right, that's what a negative event does. So the enemy, your, your bankruptcy was real, but what you're believing about it isn't. All right, so we have, so that's number, so negative event, second base is lies we believe. The event's true, but what you're believing about the lie isn't. Or what you're believing about the event may not be. So we can get stuck in a lie, and the enemy tells us what to believe about the event. So these lies are lies we choose. These can be lies that we inherit or, or embrace. They, these can be things we assign to a meaning uh, of an event like bankruptcy. It's lies we believe about God. It's lies we believe about ourselves. It's lies we believe about others. Listen, there's a battle for your heart. If you don't know there's a battle for your heart, you'll blame God. You'll blame your spouse. You're, you're going to blame everybody. So the enemy wants us to do this. All right, so a negative event or lies. And then this, the bottom one is our mechanism for defenses. We know that the ancient word for that's called a stronghold. I don't, have, I don't have enough time to teach that, like the, you know, the tower on a wall, which was the stronghold. Safest place to go if the walls get breached. Well, let's just for today call them defense mechanisms. So we, the lie creates a feeling of worthlessness, shame, guilt, un- unworthiness. That's what the lie is doing in our hearts, okay? So I, we have these events. You know, my spouse had an affair on me. What does that mean about me? This means, oh, I'm, I must not have been a good husband. I must not have been a good wife. I'm not good enough. This is the lie. That's a lie, and there's a feeling 
of unworthiness or shame attached to it. So now I don't want to feel this shame, so I'm going to build a defense mechanism. And the, the broad thing is it's a mask. I'm good. I'm good. This is emotional isolation. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to keep it to myself. It's intellectualizing ideas, books. You know, I don't, you know, I need to appear smart. It's blame shifting. It's never my fault. We rationalize. It's denying the wound. It's control. It's preemptive rejection. I'm not going to let you get close enough. It's denial. It's minimizing. It's withholding trust. It's busyness, anger, passive, aggressive. It's um, acting out. I don't want to get time to unpack all this. I'm like machine gunning you. Um, it's sarcasm. It's hiding. It's running from the problem. It's fantasizing. It's escape. It's all the time on the video games. It's spending, um, it's spending uh, money. It's withholding from others. It's withdrawing. It's overeating. It's inner vows. I'm not going to be. I'm always going to do this. Or It's all of these are the mask. You seeing this? Negative event lies. There's a feeling attached. So I don't want to feel that. So I'm going to do this so I don't feel that. This is the big piece. Third base is other people. Other people always feel your wall. Other people always feel your defense mechanism. They know when you're withdrawing. Then they see that pride. They see that anger. They see that control. They, they feel like they feel that. And here's what they do. They don't know to call it, oh, I'm feeling your defense mechanism. You know, that's not, you know, it's just not. Uh, they just feel it and they confront it. You know, it's always going to come out. Eventually, that anger pops or that, that, that withdrawing. They feel you pulling away. And they say, hey, wait, what's going on? And what it does is it causes another e negative event. And it reinforces the lie that I'm not good enough. And we're stuck in this anatomy of a stronghold that it, because the negative event keeps reinforcing the lie, so I put the mask back on, other people feel it, they tell me, they confront it, and here we go again and again, and we're stuck in this cycle. And so this is what we walk people through. They come in our room, in, in one of our offices, and we'll give them 10, 15 minutes to unpack, and they're wanting a solution. I'm going to say, the solution is not going to fix your problem. You need the presence of Christ. And so what we do is we walk them through this, and, in, and we may not get to everyone because when it's people, it's almost always going to be a forgiveness thing. When it's an event, it's if we'll just ask, say, hey, is there a lie you're believing? Sometimes we do this different ways, but sometimes we'll say, what's God want to say to you? And, and then we'll just pull on that thread. But sometimes we'll just say, hey, what lie are you believing right now? And they'll try to attach it to the problem, and we'll stop them. No, 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 no. Just ask the Lord. Because if there's, there's a truth that can set you free, so we say, what's the lie? They hear the lie, and then we tell them, renounce the lie, repent of it. And so, Lord, forgive me for believing the lie that I'm not good enough. I, I know that lie didn't come from you. We walk them through this. We give them language. And then we say, well, what's the truth? And, the, and then all the Bible people will just start quoting Scripture, and we stop them. Look, you're saying the Bible, and that is true. God does love you, but what does he specifically want to say to you? And because that's the truth you need to know. It's a truth. That's the truth that set you free. So they'll, so they'll stop. And, and you, your heart as, as a pastor or a leader, you, you'll get really, the Holy Spirit will give you discernment. They're just saying this because they know to say it. But it may not be the thing that God wants. And sometimes it is a Bible verse that does unlock them. But often it's like, you're beautiful. Or, or they'll just see like an image of like something. I'm like, yes, that's it. Now, ask the Lord why he showed you that. And we just keep pulling that thread. And they walk up like light as a feather. We do the same. With, sometimes we don't go through this whole thing. That would take like, you know, an hour, 15 minutes. But we'll, we'll say, hey, is there anything you're doing to protect? Ask the Lord. And they'll say, oh, yeah, I control. We hear that one a lot. I control. I like to control. And say, okay, and ask for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for being controlling. I, that's not from you. I realize that. And we have them renounce it. And then we say, hey, what's the tool that God will give you to, to stop controlling? And they'll get like a word. They'll get a picture. They're, I mean, it's been amazing. This is the anatomy of a stronghold. And this is what we walk people through. And the levels of freedom they get just from a 30 minutes with us. We've had some people who've been in counseling have said this to us. We have one woman in our church who's been through incredible trauma, a rape victim in a, like in a, in a gang-type setting, and, and all kinds of counseling, comes in our office. 
She's wanting to like undo this. And so I just say, hey, what's the Lord want to say to you? We walk her through this. She, this all comes out, and, and, and she tells us that moment, all my years of counseling, none of it did that. And she walks in freedom. Now she tells her stories. She goes to other places and tells her story. But it was this moment walking her through the anatomy of a stronghold. Now, we, this is one of the things we do at the event. We don't call it this. We don't say it that way. But we're looking for it as they're sharing. And so we know, oh, this is a lie. Or this is a negative event they're talking about. Or this is a wound. Or this is a, a self-protection. Or there's some unforgiveness. Mom keeps coming up. Why does mother keep or dad keep coming up? And so we walk them through that. I'm out of time. We will email you these notes. And then you can listen to this. Um, is there another session after this? There's no session, so I'll hang out. And I'll go for a few minutes. Uh, you know, I started late, so let's just say I get another four minutes. Are there um, any, any questions? All right. If you want to ask, yes. Oh, so the question is, hey, when they come back from this event, I'm assuming you're talking about the event. What do we have for them? So, um, well, there's a, a couple of things. We tried, like, everything from, like, well, let's give them a curriculum now. It never works. We, so what we do is we have a, after two weeks after the events, we do a debrief. They come back. We ask them how they're doing it, and we give them ways to plug in. What we've learned, the number one way that sustains this is actually just serving the church. It's really powerful. It's just serving the church and get them in a community group. If you do those two things, that's, but so we don't have like a, this is what we keep doing it. Because what we tell people, like, this is not a fix all. And we're not going to, we don't want to keep launching into something else. We want you to become a self feeder and, and start, we're giving you the tools to do this on the other side of the event. Yeah. Great question. I'm going to close in prayer in just a minute, but anyone else? Yes. 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 It's a great question. Well, we, we, the way we approach it, when we hear it in the, someone say that, we'll ask them, hey, ask the Holy Spirit, is that a generational curse? They'll tell us. And we just walk them through a prayer to break that generational curse. And often, other men in the room or women, with our, whatever event we're doing, will say, we'll ask, does anyone else have that? And then we'll just, like, corporately just do that. So it's not like everybody's, like, spilling their guts. But it's like, we'll, we'll walk them through that and People get set free. We have a prayer. We keep in front of us. Now, it's just in case, like, it's been a long night and we're spent. So we'll just, like, read the prayer. But a lot of times the Holy Spirit's just giving. So we have prayers that we keep in front of us. This is an inner bow prayer. It's a heart soul prayer. This is a deliverance prayer. This is um, generational curse prayer. This is an unhealthy attachment to a parent prayer. We have all of these prayers that we're ready to launch into. Um, and then there's always every, every event, the, the one we didn't plan for, but God leads us right through yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, do we have people that go through the event more than one time? And, and the answer is yes, yes. Great question. The answer is yes. The question was, will we put a, I'm repeating it for the recording. Will we put an age limit on events? Yes. We have learned um, we have witnessed like someone under like 22 and under, it, you know, they're, they're not quite ready as a person or, or developed yet. And I don't know what that is. They just don't run as hard as others. So we've noticed from the last event, we had a 20 year old, but it, yeah, it just depends on the individual. But we have some people that go young, and they just don't get out of it. We're watching guys in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s are getting out of it because they've been through a lot more trauma. And, and like, it's, it's, it's what Jesus said. I'm going to tell you some more than you can bear. And sometimes they go. But we have had people go the second time. Like, the first time was like, okay, wasn't ready for that. And, and then it's, but they knew, but they got something. But sometimes it's a time-released thing. It's not like the event fixes you. So we have people, what I tell people, it's like, yeah, I literally, Monday night, was in the hospital. 
Uh, I got stung by a bee at 1230 at night. I'm in the, I have an allergic reaction. Like, you know, I carry EpiPen because I'm allergic to bees. And so they, I rushed in there, and they're, like, jabbing me. This is, like, you know, 1 a.m. Monday night. So I got three hours of sleep when I came here yesterday. I got out of the hospital, got home at 4, slept, came here. But that shot in the arm, boom, boom, that fixed me. But sometimes you, it's not a shot in the arm, and you're taking a pill, Right? And work through getting that antibiotic, and it's a time-release thing. It takes a while. Well, this event's what we've learned. Sometimes for the, some guys or women, it's a shot in the arm. It's like, boom, their life has changed. Happened for Pastor Jeff. Happened for myself. For others, it's like time-released, and they might even do another event to kind of, like, go there again because they're ready. Yes, great questions. Anyone else? Uh, maybe time for one more. Yes. Yeah, you, so the question is, how do you know you have a stronghold? How you know is you literally ask the Holy Spirit. You don't know until you ask the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul said, what, what enslaved you? So he's telling the Galatians, you need to ask the Lord, what's enslaved you? And so you just ask the Lord, Lord, do I have a stronghold? And it's, when we ask people to ask that, we'll say a defense mechanism, because some people don't have the language of stronghold. So what's your defense mechanism or what's your self-protection that you're doing? And you just ask the Lord, and he'll tell you. I promise you, if you ask the Holy Spirit, you want to do it alone, right? Or just get, go in your inner room and just say, Lord, this is something I practice, by the way. I practice this. And, it's, and I'll ask the Lord, it, it, it'll come out like when I just sense, like, I think something's off in me. And I'll just ask, Lord, what, what am I doing? Is there a lie I'm believing? What, what means something like that? And he'll tell me, and I'll walk through it. And I'll say, what's the truth? Or if there's a defense thing, you tell me, hey, you're doing this. You're back to perfect. My, my, one of my walls is perfectionism. And so the Lord will say, hey, that's unrealistic. Here you're going again. And like, yes, great question. Let me pray. And thank you for hanging out. Um, and we will email you unless you snuck in, uh, but we will email you the, this anatomy of a stronghold. Father, like, yes. You have those four avenues, the four other things that you do. Yes. If someone wanted more information on the others as well, can they email Pastor Jeff to get those? Yes. Pastor Jeff will have all of that. And he will. He knows about it. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just pray something was inspired, whether it's this or you're going to give other expressions to what we talked about. I pray every person in this room, Lord, would get another level of freedom for their own life. And as they receive that, they would give it to others. Lord, if hurt people hurt people, then free people can free people. Heal people can heal people. So I pray, let freedom just burst in our hearts, Lord, and set people free within our church, Lord. So we trust you with the outcome of everything we talked about. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you guys. Have a great event.